Good afternoon. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io, and I'm here today with Stephanie Rulick, the founder of Startup Boston. Did I get your name right, Stephanie? You did. Wow. I, I, usually I asked beforehand. I forgot to do that. Today. <laughs> you did a great job. Well, thank you for having me and pronouncing well, my name correctly. Yeah, well, you're welcome. And thank you for joining us. So to start with, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as Mark mentioned, my name is Stephanie Rulick. Um, full time, I co-founded a startup called Endash. It's a content marketplace a software platform. And then on the side, I actually started a organization called Startup Boston, which is all about connecting um, the Boston startup community. Um, so kind of, you know, have my hands in both sides of the startup ecosystem here in Boston, which I absolutely love. I love startups. So I'm assuming Endash is part of Startup Boston. That would make sense, right? Or which one did you start first? I started Endash first. Um, so I started Endash in um, August of 2016. Initially, I was part of a marketing agency and the CEO decided to start a software platform um, and he took me with him. So I went with him to start the customer success and community departments. Um, so I've been doing that now, I guess, for four years. Um, and because I was a new founder and had absolutely no idea what I was doing, um, I started Startup Boston because I wanted to go and network with other people um, that were going through the same thing I was. And um, it's really helped me build my network and get a lot of my questions answered as a result. Oh, very cool. So it's kind of like meetup for CEOs of startups. Does that sound right? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. So our flagship event is Startup Boston Week. Um, we just uh, wrapped up our fourth conference. Obviously, this year it was virtual. Um, but we did a five day conference in September. It brings together um, about 3,500 attendees all from throughout the startup community. So that's, you know, startup uh, customer success leads, HR leads, um, your CTOs, your other engineers, um, really everyone involved in helping a startup both start and scale. Um, and during those five days, uh, there's 3,500 people are brought together for 70 sessions featuring over 250 speakers. So it's a really fun event. Um, and then because the conference has been such a success these past few years, Startup Boston has started doing other events and initiatives to really help um, anyone in the startup ecosystem as a result year round. Interesting. And is Startup Boston uh, a nonprofit or is it an actual for-profit company or is it more of a, a, con or a networking group? Yeah, yeah, it's a for-profit company right now. Um, honestly, starting a nonprofit's really complicated. So mm -hmm. being an LLC, um, but everyone for Startup Boston is a volunteer, including myself. So it started out as just me in 2017, um, now has a team of 28 volunteers who are all enthusiastic about the startup community. So we're recruiting for 2021. If anyone wants to join in, go to startupboss.org. Sorry, I had to say it, it's my uh, No. <laughs> By the way, that does, that's what this is about. So, so what has been your experience with remote employment? To both, at, I mean, obviously, start a boss, and if they're volunteers, they're they're remote. But in general, just. Yeah, definitely. Um, so with Endash, when we first started in 2016, we were um, in office. So your typical kind of. Well, not nine to five setup because it was a startup. It was like an eight to eight setup in office. Mm -hmm. um, but with with Endash, because we are a platform that connects brands to their remote writing team, um, as head of customer success, I had a lot of experience really teaching brands how to incorporate those writers into their overall processes. Um, many, if not all, of those companies were in person, so it was kind of a learning curve. Um, and then over the past couple of years, um, Endash actually pivoted to be a remote first company about two years ago. Oh. Um, there wasn't really any reason for it. It just kind of faded into that. Basically, I mean, I was based about 45 minutes from the office. Um, and rather than spending about two hours a day driving to the office, I was like, can I just like stay at home and, you know, use that time to work? And everyone just ended up being remote first at that point. And now we don't even have an office. Um, which had honestly nothing to do with COVID. We just got rid of it because no one was going into the office anymore. So mm. it's been quite the journey, both working with clients to teach them how to work with a remote team and then also ourselves as we figured that out over the past couple of years. So you were just ahead of your time, that's all. Right? I guess so. But now everyone loves remote work. Everyone understands why I was so excited about it in the beginning. So I well, love it. <laughs> well, we, we both come from cities with a lot of traffic, so I also love it. Uh, I've been doing it for oh, yes. years and uh, you're right. You lose two hours a day minimum. 
in these big yeah cities. definitely yeah out in california i don't know how how people drive to the office there boston's awful too but yeah definitely east coast west coast something about the traffic here <laughs> and it's funny i've been to boston two times and, and i always remember you had to get i think it's a tunnel you had to get through at a certain time of day or else you were going to miss your flight right yeah yeah you basically have between the hours of like 10 30 a.m and 1 p.m during the day and otherwise like you better be heading into boston before 6 a.m or after 9 p.m it's it's ridiculous the amount of traffic that would normally happen during the day yeah it's it's, it's amazing so so on that note what do you think is the future of remote employment since you obviously are pro remote um but in general you know. yeah yeah um I have like, I've been going back and forth with this debate in my head a lot. I think it's really awesome that companies are now learning to work remotely um, because it do, definitely does save on a lot of operating costs. And actually, you know, I think definitely works for your benefit in building a culture where people are really enabled to both have a work-life balance, which is incredibly important. Um, but I do kind of think that, you know, once once we have a vaccine, people can go back to the office without a fear of having, you know, COVID, then a couple of years, it's going to come back a lot stronger than it used to. Like if you look at what's happened in the world over the past, you know, century or so, and you have like a major epidemic, everything kind of bounces back, but even more. Mm -hmm. um, so I do kind of suspect that, you know, in a couple of years, it will actually go back to having your main team in office um, but you'll still you won't lose that kind of focus of understanding that you can get even better talent or not better talent but access to better talent if you keep that remote element so I know that's kind of like a mixed bag answer but I'm just like thinking of history and then also the perks of remote and I, I guess we're all kind of guessing at this point <laughs> I, think you're right. I think most of the people I talk to say they they think it's going to be a hybrid it's not going to be the way it was I mean yeah and and traffic's one reason and uh, environment's another and just quality of life are the main reasons I hear that people like it and they, they want to be able to go into the office when they need to not exactly have to yeah a hundred percent. And you just, I mean, you have better, you have happier employees. Um, employees are really able to like spend time with their family, especially for those who have kids at home. Like those are such valuable years. I so I think, I think it's really great. Like the nice part of COVID is that you're learning how to tackle this yeah. um, and forced to figure it out. Um, yes. But I do think people will end up going to the office and just kind of keep this element with them. Yeah. Cause I th still think people like that one-on-one -on -one connection and you know just and you know happy hour people like to go to happy hour on Friday yeah yeah or even like when it comes to team communication like I for for me personally when we adjusted to like remote first like I was so used to having that kind of water cooler moment right in the office where you'd be oh. there and you can yeah you can catch up with people but then also you kind of know what's happening across mm -hmm departments or with your colleagues and what projects they're working on. Um, and when you're remote, you have to put forward a, a lot more thought in mm -hmm. organizing and kind of over communicating what's happening because there aren't those kind of in the hallway catch up moments, mm -hmm. um, which is definitely a huge learning curve. That yeah. was a struggle for us when we first pivoted. Yeah. So, well, let's, let's uh, talk about Startup Boston again. Um, do you you know, who is your target audience? Do you take people from all ver uh, verticals or is it you mainly work on tech startups or anything? And, you know, what are the benefits you give to these companies? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we do um, pull in an audience across all industries. Um, how we do it is all of our programming and more specifically our conference. Um, each track is actually a startup department. So hmm. this way we're getting every single department in your startups. You have the engineering events, the customer success events, the product events, and so on and so forth. Um, so we typically target about 10 departments with that. Um, and then as such, we make sure each of our events um, also pull in different industries. So we'll have, you know, a couple of events about, uh, we had a fashion panel this year. We mm -hmm. do a food and bev event. We had one about hardware, um, a lot of hardware events this year, actually, but it's really across industries and really the benefits, I believe, and I have a few people telling me too, so I'm not mm -hmm. completely crazy with this, um, but the benefits are two different things. So one, you got to grow your network. You got to meet people that you wouldn't necessarily meet if you went to events only in your vertical or only in mm -hmm. your city, because um, we really do have a 
a large pull from, you know, reaching out to startups in Western Mass to Cape Cod. Um, mm. So we do have a larger pull. So you can really meet a lot more people that are involved throughout the Massachusetts ecosystem. And the second is the way we structure our conferences, every single event has an actual takeaway. So if you attend your track, you're basically going through a five day boot camp of what you need to do in your department from beginning to end. So mm. we'll go, we'll tackle everything from, you know, how to hire that first employee to, you know, how to uh, create like your prototype to, okay, we're at employee 10. Like how do you scale to employee 100 to internal communications? It's really everything. So it's basically just like a free boot camp for how to build your startup depending wow. on the department you're in yeah and you i get you excited had, about this <laughs> you had 3500 attendees yeah yeah, yeah. um it was like 33,470 and like 70 if we want to get Whoa. specific <laughs> this has never happened here i'm just gonna there. there you go it's a google phone my google number all of a sudden we'll just we'll just talk through it i, I canceled the call um, You're fine. <laughs> well, that's interesting because this year was the first year you did this remote, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that, I was really. I was going to say, what kind of challenge did that pose that you weren't quite ready for? Yeah. So basically, in March is kind of when we started to get the inclination that we would most likely have to pivot. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the events in March were shut down. I want to say it was like the end of March was like officially the day Boston went to lockdown. Mm -hmm. And we kind of guessed and we're like, okay, like worst case scenario, we can't host this conference in person. So even though this conference is in September, we start planning this conference in January. So it's nine months mm -hmm. of planning. We're like, let's figure out how are we going to do this if it is remote. So we actually really started a lot of research. We did a lot of different virtual events ahead of time. We did a one day mm. conference to really figure out if we could do it. And then in May is when we officially pulled the trigger and we we're like, okay, we're going virtual. Um, and definitely like the biggest challenge for planning that virtual conference. And I would say even the same for if you're, you know, managing a virtual team um, is how do you get people to communicate and build those relationships when you're online? It's mm -hmm. not so much how do you put the content online, but how do you go and get people to talk to one another? Um, which, yeah, it's, it's for if you have a new employee that you're onboarding, if you're planning a virtual event, if your team is going remote, really anything. I think that's like the number one issue people had, especially in the beginning. And it still mm -hmm. can be an issue now. Yeah, like, it, how do you get people to talk? <laughs> yes, and, and interesting, I don't know if it was the same day. In California, everything went into lockdown on uh, March 16th, the day before St. Patrick's Day, which I gotta believe is a big day in Boston. Oh yeah, St. Patrick's Day was canceled. Everything's yes. canceled. Yes. There is there are no holidays this year. <laughs> yeah, July 4th was just another day. <laughs> oh yeah, people are so, so bummed this year when St. Patrick's Day was canceled. It yes. was like the first thing to go. That and the Boston Marathon, I think those are like the two right. well, that's April largest 15, blows. Right? Um, the Boston Marathon is in the spring. It's tax. Sorry. Right? It's April 15th, which is tech. Thank you. I was like, it's in the spring. I should know this day and I don't, but I just know everyone was very sad. <laughs> yeah. Well, and finally, you know, we've talked about remotes. There's companies like Gaper that help build, you know, help startups build products that they need. So how important do you think that's going to be going in the new environment where companies need to hire people, but they don't now necessarily have to hire them locally? Yeah, I think it's going to be really important. Honestly, I would say regardless as to whether you're in person or remote, um, working at a startup is by nature so fast paced. Um, mm -hmm. So any resources that founders or hiring managers have to really help them scale their business quickly is so incredibly valuable. Um, but especially now, since, you know, we don't have that barrier of where you're located, just having someone like you guys that can really go and be like, hey, this is the best talent, even though they're located on the other side of the globe, they're going to be a perfect fit for your team. Like, that's priceless. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, 100 times. Well, well, great. Well, Stephanie, this has been uh, fascinating. That's not often you meet someone that's running both a startup and a company that hand, that helps startups. So, well, uh, thank you. <laughs> got a new perspective. Uh, I'm sure you're rather busy. So, <laughs> well, thank you for the time, Mark. This has been so much fun. I yeah, love talking is. about remote work and startup life. So, two of my favorite things. <laughs> well, cool. And uh, well, I hope you have a great week, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. All right. Bye.